My name is Vernon Sumwalt. I'm the past president of NCAJ, and I'm here today as part of NCAJ storytelling um, with some leaders of our organization over the past 60 years, and I'm sitting before Janet Ward Black, who's past president during which years? Oh, 2002, 2003, 20 years ago. It's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it flies. All right, let's jump straight into it. Mm. Um, let's rewind the clock a little bit mm. uh, when you were reaching your adult years. Tell us how important Davidson was to you mm. in your development without mentioning the word Stephon Curry. <laughs> it's hard not to mention <laughs> Steph Curry, I have to admit, especially today. Um, Davidson was a really unique place. Uh, it was very near my hometown of Kannapolis. That was only 20 minutes away. Um, but that was probably far enough away for me at the time. And uh, it was the first, uh, I was in, there'd been one graduating class of women by the time I got there. So there were 100 women and 300 men. So it was interesting odds. Um, I went on a chemistry scholarship and uh, I planned to be a doctor my whole life. I hit organic chemistry my freshman year and that was the end of that. And I decided that I would change to uh, economics because my father always said, I want you to have a job where you never have to ask anybody for a job. Well, I knew doctors didn't have to and I'm like, well, who else doesn't? Oh, lawyers, I'll be a lawyer. And that was the intellectual rigor with which I made that decision. Uh, but Davidson was a wonderful place just to learn lots of things, uh, to meet people that were um, amazing in their own rights, uh, professors as well as students. And then my father died when over spring break my junior year. And um, that was uh, unexpected and it kind of stopped everything in its tracks. But at the time, um, I was Miss Charlotte Mecklenburg. And so he died in March, but I was to compete at Miss North Carolina in June, three months later. I did and I was fortunate enough to win Miss North Carolina. So I took my senior year off at Davidson and then went back and finished after my year as Miss North Carolina. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, let's start with your decision to become a lawyer. Hmm. Um, you didn't decide to become a lawyer when you were six years old like some people I know. I, I decided when I was four years old I was going to be a doctor. So tell us about the law and how you found it. Well, I, I loved science. I loved anything. I was, I was pretty good at it. Um, and, and when I went to Davidson, with, uh, the Cannon Foundation had given me a scholarship, so I actually had a chemistry scholarship to Davidson. And I just didn't do it the way you should do it. Um, I, I just didn't really know what else to do. And now in retrospect, I know I would have made a rotten doctor. You know, I would have been able to help one person at a time, perhaps. But now, because of the role that I've gotten to play in NCAJ in particular, but as a lawyer, I've affected lots and lots of people, uh, whether it's individual cases or groups of cases, or whether it's our work in the legislature. How did NCAJ find you? Hmm. <laughs> I'll tell you how NCAJ found me. So Bill Horsley had just been president of NCAJ when I joined his law firm in Greensboro 30 years ago. And he walked in my office and explained to me that I would be joining NCAJ and I would be attending the convention. And um, I'm oddly a very introverted person by nature. And so when I went to that first convention, I pretty much stayed in my room the whole time, except for the classes. I didn't feel awkward going to the classes. Um, but I've been coming, I think, to the convention every year uh, since 1992. Well, I guess fine was a light word to use <laughs> when, when Bill walks in and tells you you're, you're a member. Yes. <laughs> um, so you eventually became president. Yes. Um, how many female presidents preceded you? I was the third. So I was president, um, you know, the organization had existed about 30 years at that point. Uh, so we, you know, joke that it's one a decade, whether we need it or not, really didn't work out quite that way. Uh, the first two, uh, Mary Ann Talley and Liz Cunahan mm -hmm. also went to Duke Law School. So we also would joke that you only could go to Duke Law School if you were going to be a female president of NCAJ. Also not true. <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, you mentioned you were in the second class, second graduating class mm -hmm. at Davidson, or mm -hmm. second class incoming at Davidson that had admitted um, both genders. Yes. And I'm sure, having practiced myself just for 25 years, and my wife's a lawyer too, mm. it's a different challenge than it is for, for males. Yes. Um, 
tell us the good points and the bad points with that. So I'll start with, um, I joined the DA's office um, about a year after I left law school. And I had not taken trial ed, so I had no idea what, what I was doing. So I had to learn on the job there. Also, I was the first girl assistant DA, to quote the elected D DA at the time. And so nobody quite knew what to make of me, you know, that they really had not seen. They'd seen a couple of women lawyers in Salisbury and Concord, but really hadn't seen trial, women trial lawyers. Uh, that was also true of the judges. And so there were some judges uh, that thought I was the best thing since sliced bread, and others I kind of had to sell uh, that I was going to be okay. And I worked very hard to make sure that they um, that knew they knew that I would do what I said I was going to do and that I would do it on time. And over time, I think I won most of them over. But at that time, if there was the big calendar call, say, for example, in civil court, and there were 100 lawyers in the room, there might be two or three women. Uh, fortunately, that's different now, not as different as it should be based on uh, the population of the United States. Uh, but it's changed really dramatically over that time. Over now, how many years have you practiced again? So I got out of law school in 1985. Okay, so since then, what developments have you seen in improving the diversification of our legal profession, mm -hmm. of our colleagues? Well, you know, for at least 15 years, there have been more women in law school than men in the United States. So that's been true for a really long period of time. But on the negative side of that, what happens a lot of times with women when they get out of law school, maybe five or six years later, they want to start a family, it becomes more difficult. And so women sort of self-select against being trial lawyers to begin with. And then when the family often starts, then a lot of those women just realize they cannot keep up that pace. Um, and they may also pull out of the trial practice. So I think the good news is women are coming out as at least as many lawyers, if not more than men, but we really do need more in the trial practice. And things are changing con continuously. Yes. With that. What, what do you think our legal profession needs, the system needs to help that development? Mm. It's a really good question. I'm not sure that there's an easy answer at all. Um, What's interesting is uh, what's happened with the judiciary in my county, and it may be true of other North Carolina counties, but you know, people don't know who runs for judge. And a lot of times they'll select a woman they don't know over a man they don't know, and I think it's because there's this sort of a perceived fairness with women uh, that has made it where a lot of the district court judges in Guilford County are women and have been for probably five plus years. So I think that's um, maybe not the best way to decide whether somebody's the right judge, but it's interesting that there's a trustworthiness to women. And I think just um, sometimes letting women be the ones to, to resolve conflict that I think we look at problems sometimes, and not meaning to be sexist, but we look at problems holistically. How will this person feel about this? How will they see themselves if this is the outcome? And I think having women to be absolutely integral in difficult decision-making can really uh, improve the room. So it's not just about fixing something, it's about right. an empathetic approach. Yes. I'm yes. not going to explain how I know that. <laughs> So, um, you know, life of a trial lawyer is sometimes difficult. Yes. Um, but you weren't always a trial lawyer. How did you start out in the field? Well, as I told you, you know, I didn't know that I even wanted to be a lawyer. It just kind of happened. And then when I got to Duke Law School, I thought being stood up to answer questions was the awfulest thing in the entire world. And so I knew that whatever I did in law, I did not want to speak in public because I hated it. So I didn't take trial ad, I didn't do anything that would require me to stand up more than I absolutely had to in law school. So I thought, well, you know, I'll be a corporate lawyer and I'll help businesses and I'll um, maybe manage um, sports stars or movie stars. And when I got into law school, I had an extraordinarily difficult time finding a job. So a little tiny law firm in Charlotte with two lawyers hired me and I was grateful for it. Um, and I did that kind of work for about 10 months, and I realized that I'm not that kind of person. 
I really don't get all excited about page 17 and where the semicolon is and how to reword a sentence that I needed something more dynamic and where people were involved. And so um, I got brave enough to ask the DA for the job and fell into that and then had three and a half extraordinary years of trial experience. Every member of NCAJ looks in the mirror at some point and I think they, they feel this way. Mm -hmm. I know I did and, I, and everyone I've talked to, all the younger lawyers I know, have said this. Um, they call it imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your experience when, you know, because you said I didn't want to be a lawyer, you know, I found myself in a courtroom, didn't want to public speak. Tell us at the point in your career where you looked in the mirror and you said, I can do this. I'm still waiting for that moment. Um, that making light a little of it, you know, I think you, you need to have a realistic recognition of what you don't know. And I think that makes the best lawyers. It's not the ones who are like, I got this, I can handle it, but rather the ones that kind of come at, at it with, no, seriously, there are probably people who know a lot more about this and I can learn every day. And I think that's one of the great joys of being a lawyer. There's not a day that goes by that I don't learn something amazing, whether it's about medicine or about law or just uh, politics or how to get things done. So um, I think for me, it's, um, it's not been that there was a moment where I went, I've got this. But there comes a time though, at least for me, when I realized that I was the authority figure in the room and that people were looking to me for um, direction, for strategy. And so that probably, you know, it, being in leadership at NCAJ, that sort of forces you into that position. And uh, I'm very grateful for NCAJ making it where my learning is quite holistic in how things have to happen in the state of North Carolina. Let's walk, walk that puppy down the road a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you're president of NCAJ, mm -hmm. uh, 2002-2003. Obviously, you were in leadership before that. Yes, many years. Tell us about that um, that period in time. What mm -hmm. was NCAJ like? How has it changed since then? So I, I came through the ranks as predominantly a membership vice president. And then I think I had one or two years uh, as legislative vice president. And so that was a great thing, to be able to have to be concerned about what do the members want, uh, what adds value to them, and then to be in that sort of political realm where you understand that in order for consumers and um, the accused to be protected in North Carolina, you have to be on Jones Street. You have to be at the North Carolina legislature. You have to understand the politics of, of how things are done there or the rights of those people are gonna be trampled. And frankly, the trial lawyers is the group of people, the trial lawyers are the group of people that make that difference, that go stand in the gap and fight for consumers and people who are accused. We don't have a big consumer lobby in North Carolina. You know, we are the ones um, that are called upon to fight. So, we're all human. And sometimes trial lawyers are their own worst enemy um, in the media or, or maybe even in court sometimes. How as an organization can we improve? How mm. can we be better, mm. and build a better image for trial lawyers as mm. we move forward? Mm. Well, on the positive side, the image of trial lawyers right now is dramatically better than it was when I was president 20 years ago. There was a period of time where sort of the national a political stance was that lawyers were a pariah and that crushing lawyers was sport, that it was, um, that bashing lawyers was what would get the applause line. But what's really interesting about what's happened, particularly in the last, say, four or five years, is that there is a, a renaissance, a resurgence of a respect for lawyers and I think it stems at least in part because of what's happening with the um, awful civil rights violations that have occurred in the United States and that people can see that it is lawyers who are the ones to making sure that justice is done as best as it can be for certain families. So I think we are improving. Uh, the trial lawyers, we just have to do it how we've always done it. 
we be a member of our community, we're engaged, we stay after church and answer people's questions for free, we, we try to serve on boards and just be somebody who can add value and we add a unique perspective because we do know how the law works in the state and in the country. You dreamed of being a doctor when you were young, moved over to being a lawyer. Let, let's take all that off the table. If you weren't a lawyer, what would you be and why? I have no idea. I have no idea what I would be. Because the truth is, I think I found my calling. And I can't imagine any other life than what I'm doing. Um, they laugh at my office that I've been sitting in the same office, in the same desk, for 30 years, and that I can't imagine quitting. I can't imagine not using what talents I believe God has given me to try to make the playing field more even for people. So um, I guess, you know, it would be great if I could say um, a ballerina or something similar, uh, but right now I just love being a lawyer. We all like to talk about our wins, and, and we've all been here, mm -hmm. um, so, so there's a lot of vulnerability. Tell us about a memorable case of yours mm -hmm. that wasn't a win, mm -hmm. and, and what you learned from it. Can I tell you about a process instead of an individual case? So when I left the DA's office, um, one of my adversaries, the person I had all the capital cases against, came to me and said, we're starting an asbestos litigation practice. Would you like to come join us? And I didn't know what asbestos was, but I thought that sounded like a pretty good idea since she offered me $10,000 more a year than I was making. I was making 20,000 at the time, so that sounded like a really great deal. So I started uh, it with the litigation practice. I'd come from the, the criminal courtroom where I didn't know what depositions were, I didn't know what dis written discovery was. Remember, I didn't take trial ad, so I had really no idea about how the civil process functioned. And it ended up that we had a summer where we had 60 clients that needed to be deposed in the asbestos litigation. And I walked in the very first day and there were 30 lawyers, defense lawyers there, all of whom who were going to ask our client questions, most of whom who did not graduate from high school. They worked, had great jobs at a power plant, but were not particularly educated people. And I watched those 30 lawyers fillet my client. And then I came back the next day for it to happen to the next client, and the next day to happen to the next client. So actually how I learned how to be a better trial lawyer was watching spectacular defense lawyers and watching them ask questions and then trying to learn how to protect the plaintiff, protect the client in the next depositions that occurred after that. We have defense lawyers that you mentioned and, and we call ourselves trial lawyers yes. on the plaintiff side. The, the purposes of defense lawyers are different than the purposes of trial lawyers. Yes. Yet we're colleagues, we're professional, we work you know, across the lines. What is a trial lawyer? A trial lawyer is someone who should be motivated by a sense of justice, of changing that which is wrong to that which is right. Um, Desmond Tutu said that if an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you tell the mouse you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. And that if you remain neutral, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Trial lawyers get to be the ones that we stand on the side of the oppressed and we make a difference. And you found your calling as a trial lawyer. Yes. Did the values that go along with being a trial lawyer find you in that process or did you already have those values and they matched up to becoming a trial lawyer later, which, which do you think it was? I, I think for me that the values were there from the beginning and then why I probably was dissatisfied with the work that I was doing in the corporate sphere is it didn't let me express that sort of sense of justice that I, I feel is innate in me. So we talked about the vulnerable stuff, you know, the, the process of learning when, um, and we've all been in those uncomfortable mm -hmm. situations where you go, oh gosh. Yes, and I just want to die. <laughs> Tell us about um, 
a case where you succeeded mm. and you thought, I've done it. Mm. Well, I had a really interesting uh, car wreck case um, when I was practicing in Salisbury. And it was um, a, a double fatality. Our client died. She was a, a hospice nurse. She had two small children. Uh, she was killed by um, NASCAR's Rookie of the Year, Rob Moroso, uh, who drove home drunk and unfortunately lost his own life in that wreck as well. Um, we had the opportunity then to sue Oldsmobile and the bar where he and a number of people from NASCAR were drinking as well as um, a, another corporate entity that his family was associated with. And, um, and there were some of the best and the brightest who were defending that case. Uh, he was, Moroso was the new generation of Oldsmobile, so he actually was a spokesperson for that and then ended up with a .22 on blood alcohol level uh, at his autopsy. What's been amazing about that case is I have taught um, law and justice, uh, law as a career for women at Girl State for rising high school girls now for 33 years. And I use the pictures from that case even as recently as this week to explain to young women that even though my client had not had a drop to drink, she, her life ended just as much as that defendant did and that those two children had to grow up uh, with, with no mother. And so I can use it as a teaching piece, not just for lawyers, but in fact for uh, younger people who are hopefully making good decisions about what their, uh, what their driving habits are. How do we teach, how do we teach young lawyers this? I mean, you've had mm -hmm. decades of experience mm -hmm. and, and you know, I think you would agree with me that we only learn from our failures and right. mistakes. Yes. Um, it's easy to, to plug into the internet and just read about yes. stuff in a very abstract way now, and I think that's how people learn. But how mm. do we get young lawyers into the courtroom more? Mm. I think it's really hard to get trial experience now if you're a young lawyer. I consider myself very fortunate that I had those years in the DA's office. So, you know, there were two years where all I did was try jury trials. It's hard to compare with that unless you're in the public defender's office, for example. So I think what you kind of have to do is just push them into it. Um, and, and you wanna do it to make sure that the client is not compromised in any way, but you do want to make sure that you're alongside there to protect that, but give the opportunity if you possibly can. A lot of my practice is in federal court and almost nobody goes to federal court anymore. You know, everything's done by the papers. But I think one of the greatest things that we can do for young lawyers is to have them realize you need to have exquisite mediation skills because the truth is 99% of cases settle, the vast majority of them now by mediation. And so the preparation and the presentation is different than how you would prepare and present at trial. But we need to be teaching those skills how can NCAJ do that? Well, I think it would be great to just focus on mediation skills and use some of the great mediators that we have. Have workshops where uh, you find out what cards the other side was holding back and how you didn't know to push and what the outcome would be. To learn often from mediators about what mistakes, and particularly for people like me, plaintiff's lawyers, I've always heard we go down too fast. We start too high and we go down too fast. Uh, there's at least one really famous lawyer here, Wade Bird, who that he doesn't do that. I think he comes maybe 10% off of his original demand, and you can learn a lot because then he's garnered that reputation with the defense where they know if he's asking for a certain amount, that's really what he's expecting, and that's a pretty impressive reputation to have. We're sitting here today, 2022, in Charlotte, you know, a couple hundred yards from where we had our first convention yes. 60 years ago. Yes. Um, we've recently come off a pandemic. You know, two years of courts in Mecklenburg County pretty much shut down. What have we learned from that as trial lawyers and how do we take that to the next level in moving mm -hmm. forward and improving our, our services for clients? You mean the, the pandemic specifically? Pandemic. Okay. Well, I, let me tell you what I think the benefit of the pandemic was for me. I didn't realize how many times I would come in a room and hear somebody's name 
or I would end up in a classroom experience where everybody in a CLE, you look at the back of their head or they're looking at the back of yours. To me, the great benefit of Zoom was having people's faces and having their names, and I feel like I actually learned the identity of a lot of people through that. I think the big risk, though, in what has happened with Zoom is now we have less margin than we had before. That if you could have put five meetings in a day on Zoom during a day in the pandemic, that pace has kind of continued, but people still want to open up and be in person. And so all of that drive time and the ability to process and do a little work in between uh, doesn't seem quite as plentiful to me as it was before. You've practiced since 1985, been in a bunch of different environments legally in our profession. Um, you were past president of NCAJ, been in leadership, you've had a successful practice. Um, what is this whole experience of becoming a lawyer, which kind of found you by chance? Mm -hmm. What does it taught you about yourself? Mm -hmm. What have you learned? You have to do it afraid. There are so many things in my life that I didn't choose to do because I was afraid. And that if you can just get to the point where you can push through that, and realize that it may in fact be a limiter of you in your practice or your representation of your client or your ability to really change the world. I think you just have to learn how to do it afraid. I am far from perfect, but I'm a whole lot better than I was when I walked into Duke Law School. What was it, the movie Parenthood? Great quotation um, by the grandma who says, you know, I had a chance of riding the merry-go-round or the roller coaster, and I said, I'll ride the roller coaster any day of the week. Mm because it's, uh, I guess it's the fear factor there, but yes. that's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.